forward slash CP Brenda Jones. I, you know, I always ask to my guests, and I and I make a joke out of it. I don't know. I, I have a few millennials with me, but I'm sure County Exec remember when we just had a pager, and we thought we were somebody because we had that beeper tapped on to us, and now we have Zoom and we have the telephones, and I'm just wondering what will we have in um, five years from now, what is it gonna be? And whoever would have thought we would be having virtual meetings and Zoom meetings. And I guess, you know, God knew what was going on. And for such a time as this, we have the technology to be able to meet and do whatever we need to do from home and some from the car or wherever we need to be. We have no excuse for not being there because we can still be there. So I thank God for that. And, I, and again, I thank God for you all being here with me. I say to everyone, welcome to Live from the Table. Today's edition is Detroit Businesses Doing Business in Detroit. Listeners and viewers on Facebook will also be able to ask questions at the end of our discussion. But before we begin that discussion, again, my special guest for today is Wayne County Executive Warren C. Evans. So don't get it twisted. He has that C, in case you know another Warren Evans, he has that C in the middle of his name. Um, <laughs> recently, um, Mr. Evans, you proposed that all returning citizens who are paroled receive a state ID and a voter's registration card. Can you just tell us why you think and why we know that this proposal is so important and how is it progressing? Uh, well, I think it's, it's progressing uh, well, Madam President, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, loved working with you for many, many years and hope we get to do it uh, for many, many years more. The, it, it, obviously the, the issues that are going on throughout the country, not just the disproportionate effect of, of COVID-19 on uh, people of color, uh, but also the protests throughout the country, just helps to create the atmosphere for people to get serious about what side of this issue they're on. You, you know, you always get lip service when something like this comes. People are great at talking out the sides of their mouths about how concerned they are, and, uh, uh, and, and one of the issues that people always talk about is the importance of reentry programs. And I know you've been actively involved in uh, trying to create that dynamic for people that get out of prison. But the reality of it is, how can you have a viable reentry program when the vast majority of people you release from prison, you don't even release them with identification? Mm -hmm. They don't have personal identification. Uh, they don't have anything. And, you know, for those callous enough to say, well, why don't they just go to the Secretary of State's office? That's ridiculous. First of all, transportation is an issue. Second of all, money's an issue. And third, and probably more importantly, who wants to stand in front of some clerk in the Secretary of State's office and explain what you did with the last five years of your life? I mean, you're trying to turn your life around. You're not trying to regurgitate uh, the past. And so I think uh, the state should definitely do that to at least give people uh, some leg up when they come out. Having been a cop most of my life, I absolutely understand when someone is stopped on the street for a legitimate reason, maybe, not always legitimate, but when they're stopped and they have no ID, what happens? The police handcuff you and hold you until they can figure out, they can sort things out. That's not a reentry program. That's, that's, in and of itself creating a confrontation between uh, that person who's try in, trying to reintegrate themselves uh, and the police department. Just so for all those reasons, I, I mean, I think that's really low hanging fruit and they should be ashamed not to have done it already, but hopefully it will get done soon. And I truly, completely agree with you. Um, and also just to let you know, I will be introducing a resolution to support the parolee receiving state ID and voters registration cards. So, because it, it is so important because even with my skilled trades task force and they're saying we're coming home and they have no nothing. 
And so it, it's definitely really hard on them. And so I definitely will be supporting um, that state ID and voters registration card. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. And, and, but since I have you here, I have to ask you about current events. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the state and the federal government have legislation to address bias training and other police reforms. Recently, you know, there's been a very loud demand to defund the police. Now, you are a former police chief for the city of Detroit and county sheriff. What's your thoughts about um, the defunding of police and law enforcement? I, I think, first of all, police are asked to do a number of things that aren't police work. Uh, and a number of things that, quite frankly, police aren't trained or even psychologically prepared to deal with. There's a, there's a big difference between helping someone with a mental health problem, uh, dealing with people in, a, in domestic violence issues, and playing cops and robbers. And I'm not discounting the cops and robbers piece. That I used to love that. But I understand that a lot of what police get called to do are things that they're not prepared to do, not equipped to do, and frankly, don't bring public benefit uh, to the community. And so if defunding the police means condensing the police into more police activity and spending that additional money in mental health and you know, uh, family crisis intervention, number of other things by people who really have a passion for that, and I think that's fine. So it's I, in my mind, it's not getting rid of the police, but it's getting the police to function where they're best adept at functioning. And then, you know, and then from there, quite frankly, the reality is, you know, I, and it just kind of gets me, so I guess I got to say it. You know, all of the talk about sensitivity training and, you know, uh, uh, bias training and all of that, I mean, if we're going to be perfectly honest. I have taught diversity classes in past years for a long time. And there's a group of officers, usually not officers of color, but sometimes who come in, sit in the back of the room, cross their arms and, you know, uh, give you that stare for about eight hours. Like, uh, you know, I know I got to sit through this crap, but I'm not into it. What, what that means is we're not always hiring the right people to do the job. And so, you know, you can, you can get rid of chokeholds and you can do all of those peripheral signs of something. But the truth of the matter is we have to do better at hiring people that care about people. Uh, and until we do that, there will always be, uh, you know, some, some tensions and some uh, lack of objective behavior on, the, on behalf of police. And I'm certainly not condemning all police officers. I, I would never do that. There are many hardworking, great police officers, but it doesn't take but a few to taint it, and because of this kind of blue line thing, if they're the most senior people, then the younger officers, whose heart's really in the right place, but too weak to challenge the senior guys, and you know, if, if that's the case, then, then you're, you're complicit. I mean, you don't mean to be, but you are. I thank you so much for giving us um, time out of your busy schedule, which I know is extremely busy these days. Never too busy for you, Madam President. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean um, that. I don't know, County Exec. I think we are more busier now since we have Zoom calls <laughs> than we actually were when we were sitting in the office because I find myself going call behind call behind call behind call. And so it, I don't think. I don't know. I, I was quite busy in the office running from here to there, but now it's just call behind call. And then it seems like it doesn't stop. Sometimes yeah. it's calls at eight and nine o'clock at night. And I'm saying, okay, I didn't do this in the office. And I might go to a meeting and still be at a meeting that late, but a call, be, a, a meeting beginning at eight or nine o'clock, that wasn't right. that often. So I just want to, again, thank you so much for being here with us today. And you know, I know you have to go on with your busy schedule and you'll not be able to stay, but I'm gonna say to you, um, have a very productive rest of the day and stay safe um, if you have to go out and be out there. And you know what I always say, put that mask on, be safe out there. So thank you again so much for 
um, giving us some minutes out of your busy day today, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And so we're going to return back to um, what we have been talking about in what has been happening. Um, it is so important to ensure that we are supporting and uplifting not only small businesses and development within the city of Detroit, but black businesses doing business in the city of Detroit and especially within the community and within the neighborhoods. So first, let me go to um, the Detroit Legacy City Group, uh, which is a Detroit minority company, which is developing the Detroit Pizza Bar in the Six Mile and Living Noise area. And joining me today is Mrs. Olumba and Mr. <laughs> Marcus Jones. And for Good anyone afternoon. that does not know, he's not my brother. <laughs> he's not my brother, but he's not my biological brother. You know, they say, don't let the Joneses get you down. So <laughs> he is my brother, though. Um, it, it, I, I have to say, I don't think we are related, but we don't, we, we never know. We never know, right? Right. We'll, we'll have to you look into know. it. You just never know. And so I, I want to thank you both for being here with us as well. Can you explain why you chose to develop your businesses within the neighborhood rather than in another area? You know, everybody is always looking at downtown, midtown, um, and all of those areas. Explain why you decided to go over to my old neighborhood, Six Mile, uh, McNichols, and Livinois. Um, I'll take this one. So we'll, we'll try and tag team it here. Um, I think as a native Detroiter and somebody who grew up in Detroit and somebody who uh, Marcus and I approached the development is really a community development. Um, it was extremely important and deliberate of us to develop inside our communities, right? Like you said, everybody wants to be in Midtown, everybody wants to be in downtown. But the reality is, is that for in D Detroit to enjoy a revitalization, we've got to begin in those neighborhoods, right? You should be able to eat a meal in your neighborhood. You should be able to walk to your neighborhood and eat a meal. Um, and so when we thought about this idea of a pizza bar that's a full service restaurant, and when we talked about approaching it from a design aspect, we said, you know what we'll do? We're gonna take downtown and put it on McNichols, right? And so, that is the design for this, right? It's more than just a one-story restaurant. It's a two-story restaurant. We took two storefronts um, and we're turning them into a bi-level with a rooftop terrace, 5,800 square feet. That'll be able to uh, sit and serve 192 individuals, uh, two full bars with the full uh, menu. Um, and so we knew and we're very deliberate about developing in Detroit, but also starting to change the way we develop in our communities, right? Not everything has to be small, not everything has to be takeout, but at some point in time, we have to be able to look at our communities and say, yes, I can have my son's graduation here. Yes, I can have you know my event. Yes, we can host fundraisers. And so Marcus and I were very deliberate about doing this in a community. Um, it was also helpful that Invest Detroit, you know, as they started rolling out their development plan, along with city council, that they also understand the importance of developing in the neighborhoods. And so there's a very deliberate, um, a, a very deliberate and thoughtfulness for this group of development that is going in the McNichols corridor. Thank you, thank you for that. And, and I appreciate, like I said, I grew up over there. I still have a home over there. My aunt is, is living there and I'm almost over there every day. Okay. And so I just truly appreciate what you all are doing. I tell people all the time, there is more community and more neighborhood than there is downtown in Midtown. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and everybody always just gets excited about downtown and Midtown, but I think everyone in the neighborhoods and in the community 
should have the same access to whatever is downtown, whatever is in midtown. You shouldn't have to leave the neighborhood if you just don't want to have to leave your neighborhood. And so I just truly appreciate what you all are doing. So one of the issues that we know for, de uh, for developers is the uh, access to financing. And, and so can you just provide a breakdown on what financing mechanisms you are using to support your development? So I'm gonna do a quick um, share screen because some of this is a little easier because we do have some um, slides that I think will be helpful for the users to see as well. Um, okay. So, uh, Marcus, do you want to take this or you want me to take it? Um, you're the finance person, so okay. I'm the construction guy. <laughs> Marcus does all the construction and workforce development. Um, and so in order to pull this development off, then you'll, you'll see, we ended up doing a lot of things that most developers do. We had to develop a capital stack that makes sense. Um, our big portion of our capital stack comes from Invest Detroit. So Invest Detroit did our real estate loan and our construction loan. We also have strategic neighborhood fund dollars um, that come in for that gap financing. Um, we were just at PED's table last week. And so we were granted um, our OPER certificate um, and then utilizing the DWSD program for our green infrastructure, so our gray water system and um, our solar panels, we took it, we were able to take advantage of that program that's offered through the city of Detroit. So to be honest, you know, we, we did a lot of things, but mainly the things that were helpful to us were the things that uh, the city council, the mayor's office and the private investment firms together, they got together is really why we're able to do these developments in the community, right? Um, with Invest Detroit and with DGC and City Council, it has allowed us to be able to introduce these kind of downtown restaurants in communities where, you know, the, the, the square footage or the cost per square, square footage wouldn't support the performance. So, uh, we were able to do all this. We've got probably about $1.3 million in construction and construction costs and um, building out. Uh, this is what the building looked like previously. And this is kind of what it will look like when it's finished. So you can see it looks very much like something you would see in Midtown or something very much like you would see um, in downtown, so we're quite proud of the, the work that we've been able to do. And it looks good. I was just over there yesterday. It looks really, really, really good. I am so proud of what you all are doing right there on that, uh, right off the corner. So right. It looks really good. So can you just describe your community outreach process? Okay. So, um, you know, we actually did a total of about 15 community meetings um, and we work in collaboration with uh, Invest Detroit but the Live 6 Alliance um, and they were super helpful in really connecting us to the various um, both large and smaller community block groups and clubs that existed uh, within uh, I would say about a five mile radius of the site. And so we um, talked to folks from the Bagley community, Fitzgerald community, uh, the entire Live Six community, even had some um, outreach events held over at Mary Grove College. Um, and the goal was we really wanted to hear what the people wanted. Uh, we didn't want to be developers that just came into the neighborhood and said, hey, here's a project that we're doing and nobody has any input. No, we wanted to understand what did the people have a taste for, uh, allow them to uh, participate in, in just some of the initial thought process of, around the design and the development of the building. And within that, one thing came clear is everybody was not only excited to have a restaurant in their neighborhood, but the possibility of jobs. And I really believe that was the, the biggest um, conveyor of support that we got from individuals was that we love the fact that the restaurant is coming, but we also love the fact that there are going to be jobs here in our neighborhoods and our young people will be able to walk and have gainful employment right in their backyards. Okay, and, and on that, 
Can you describe your hiring and your training process? Yeah, so we have um, a very hands-on approach um, to workforce development. My background is in workforce development um, as well as Akuna. And essentially it is um, the crux of how our team operates. We are always constantly thinking about not only the end users that's going to use the development, but how we're going to create jobs through that process. And so um, currently right now, our goal is to have minimum 51% employers on that job. And so we work with individuals that are coming out of various programs to give them their first opportunity on these type of construction jobs. Um, but then inside of the restaurant itself, we have a six to eight week training program. And that is for everybody from the management level, um, to the, the bar backs or just the cooks and the dishwasher. Everyone will go through safe serve training, first aid CPR, and depending on their particular field or in position, they'll go through additional training per that position. But the goal is that people will be able to come in um, not knowing anything, get upskilling and training through us, get real hands-on experience working in the restaurant, and then the goal is they'll want to continue to move on. Some might want to go to culinary school. Others might want to become uh, a restaurant manager themselves or own their own restaurant. But the goal is uh, we want to provide them with that first stepping stone into a career in the hospitality industry. Um, so from the hiring, the training, we provide them great wages and benefits. So a part of this development is we're doing profit share with employees and we're providing livable wages so that folks can actually have a real job to a job where they can live off of and they're actually making good money to feed their family and their kids. Um, and then from there, we continue to provide additional training so that we can retain those employees and provide those upskilling so that they can continue to advance in their careers. And from there, we hope that they're running the next biggest restaurant or uh, managing a five-star restaurant in, in downtown Detroit or, or New York City. But the goal is that we want to continue to help all of our employees grow. Thank you, and I truly appreciate that. So if I am a Detroiter and I want to apply for a job, what do I need to do? So you can follow us on um, Instagram at pizzabardetroit.com or um, go to our websites when we have a couple. So you can go to um, pizzabardetroit.com and go down. To, um, there's a huge banner that will pop up, and it says apply now. Uh, we are also sharing on our various social medias on both Legacy City um, and Pizza Bar Detroit um, application links. Um, you can pick up physical applications um, by swinging by the site. So we're really trying to be um, as exclusive as possible. And we really want to uh, recruit and hire Detroiters for this opportunity. I truly uh, appreciate what you all are doing. And, and, and again, I truly appreciate you doing it in the community and in the neighborhoods. That is so important that people realize you can do things in the community. You can do things in the neighborhoods. The community and the neighborhoods appreciate you coming to their community, you doing things in their community and having access to great things in their community and not having to travel downtown in midtown and Nothing against me inside of downtown, but uh, just having something in the community. And as I'm looking at my um, looking at my page, and the first thing I see smiling is a picture of um, my staff person, Linda Wesley, which takes me back to the days. And she might kill me for this, but one of her first jobs was at Greg's Pizzeria. And but, the but Greg's was not as fortunate to be a five-star restaurant like you guys. And when I say five-star, <laughs> having that ability to sit down, get all of the training that they're being able to get. I mean, we love Greg's Pizza. And I can mm -hmm. tell you that community loves pizza. And to be mm -hmm. able to have a place where you can literally go in, get that training, sit there and eat, um, have a graduation party there, do whatever you want to do. We had one good restaurant that you were able to sit down that I can remember. I think two. we had one on six mile. We had one on seven mile. But to be able to say there's a piece of bar that you can go in right there in the community, right in the neighborhood, 
I, I'm just so happy. Let me ask if you were to give some tools and some tips to those that were interested, what would you say to them? Um, interested in developers or restaurants or? Any tools and tips that you would give to anyone who's interested in doing what you all are doing. And um, even with just hiring yeah. and training. I think that you have to, at some point, you have to ask yourself always, what am I doing for the community that I live in, right? Um, and so I think if you can start with that question, you'll come up with an answer. No matter what your answer is, it's going to benefit both you and the community. And so we always start with that. Like, what are we trying to put into the community? What are we trying to give to the community? And then we back into everything else from that. Like, um, and so I think if you can do that in any part of wherever you're gonna be, if you're gonna be an elected official, if you're going to be a restaurateur, if you're gonna be a construction person, if you're saying, what is it that I want my community to have or be reflective of, you will find something um, you will find something, the world has a funny way of bringing that to your door. Um, and so that's the advice I would give. Marcus, do you have something? You know, I, I would piggyback off that. Um, you know, this, the idea of the pizza bar um, actually started because we recognized that the community didn't have what you said, which is a six down restaurant. And then they really didn't have places that serve healthy food. And so our goal with this is really to try to bridge that gap to show that you can eat good, and, but it doesn't have to always be fried and unhealthy um, because our pizza is wood fire and it's baked and all of our wings and pastas and salmon dishes, they're all are baked. And so we look at what can we bring this community because yes, Greg's Pizza is an awesome place and we want people to continue to um, support them, but we wanted an environment where people can get more than just a pizza to go. And, and also have a healthy meal. And so if you take that approach of recognizing the need in your community and not being afraid to go out there, take some risk to be to better someone else and to better the, the environment around you, um, you're, you will always be successful. Thank you so very much. Um, you guys are awesome. I look forward to seeing you guys because I come in and sit down and enjoy myself yeah. uh, yes. while I'm social distancing. Yeah. I look forward to it. So thank you. Can you all stay in case we have time for caller questions? Um, can you just hold on till we complete with our next guest? Yes, we Absolutely. can. And thank you for having us, um, President Jones. This is a great opportunity. And so we're just glad to be able to have this conversation with you. And we're grateful for everything that you're doing to advance the city of Detroit forward. Yes, thank thank you. you. And thank you both for everything that you all are doing and moving um detroit forward thank you and i truly appreciate you all so next right in the same area we have a joint venture contract to provide construction services for the west magnetical streetscape and to talk about this project i am joined by some awesome people again we have a tony stewart Nimit from the city's office of contracting and procurement we have Mr. Brian McKinney, the founder and CEO of Gardenia, uh, and, and I know I never said right company. <laughs> and we have Mr. Michael Sepetsi of Major Cement. Good afternoon to you all, and thank you for being here with us. I want to start off with you, Tony, if you can, just describe what a joint venture is. Can't hear you. She's going to call in. Um, and again, we have some awesome people. Just before we get into you, Brian, I just want her to let people know what uh, a joint venture is. While she's calling in, I want to say thank you to Chris Perry, who is um, being the interpreter for today. I got to give him a round of applause. They always do an awesome job. And so thank you so much for being here 
with us um, interpreting um, for us today. We truly appreciate you. Tony, you ready? That's what I say about technology, right? <laughs> so we can see her zooming in and then we can also see her with her phone. You're on, Tony. Okay, thank you, Council President, for having me today. Um, so to your question, what is a joint venture? Um, a joint venture is when uh, two companies come together, um, two separate companies, I should say, come together to form um, a joint venture for a specific product, uh, or I'm sorry, for a specific contract. Um, with a joint venture, one of those companies um, must be a Detroit-based business or Detroit um, small um, certified business or Detroit resident business, or they can be a Detroit headquarter business or a Detroit um, micro business. Um, one of the important things about the joint venture is that um, in all phases of the project, the certified company must be included. So this joint venture can't be something where um, a company comes together and they're just using a smaller company for their certification or something. Um, they must be included in 51% um, of the total performance of this project. And in addition to that, they must share in all profits and all losses of the joint venture. And that, that agreement is sent to us for approval. Okay, uh, thank you for that description. Now, let me just ask you a question. So how do you feel that joint ventures benefit small and minority-based businesses? Um, joint ventures benefit small and minority companies because it allows them an opportunity um, to learn from the company that they're working with if it's a larger company. Um, it allows them access to understanding how that business works so that um, they have an opportunity later when another bid comes for them to bid on it by themselves. So from the experience that they get from the joint venture, it allows them to go out on their own for increased business um, for themselves. Okay, and, and one last question for now. What work has the Office of Contracting and Procurement um, in Creole been doing behind the scenes to build joint ventures similar to what we're getting ready to talk and see today? So uh, behind the scenes, the Office of Contract and Procurement and the Civil Rights and Inclusion and Opportunity um, Department, we have been sending information out to all of the contractors, encouraging them to develop joint ventures. Um, this will allow a lot of the smaller minority companies to get more bids. Uh, we've been hosting um, outreaches digitally, such as the ones that we have with you, the small business empowerment fairs. And we've been telling everyone about um, joint ventures and certifications and how um, they can get those certifications. Um, one other important part that we've been sharing with people is that when you enter into the joint venture, you do receive additional credit um, for your bid. Um, and we have also placed on the supplier portal for all suppliers a link so that they can directly go into the system and see more information about joint ventures on every be it opportunity that comes through the Office of Contract and Procurement. Thank you so much for that great information to help assist our businesses um, in the city of Detroit. So, and, and you know, we call on you all the time, Tony. Thank you so much for always being there when we call on you and thank you to your boss for allowing you to be there when we call <laughs> upon you. And thank you to the whole department for the work that you all do. I'm gonna move on to you, um, Major Seaman and Brian, I'm not gonna mess your company's name up again. I'm going to let you uh, give the name of your own company so that I don't mess it up. 
And let me just say before you do that, that both of these companies are Detroit businesses that employ Detroiters. Major Seaman employs 48% Detroiters, and Brian's company, which I'm not going to mess up, is a minority-owned company that employs 81% Detroiters. Mr. McKinney, go ahead and give your company's name and tell us about some of the challenges um, that you're seeing with small minority businesses. Well, first of all, thank you for having us, uh, Council President, and it's Guyanga. Um, but you know, everyone does that. Uh, so, and you know, know, I'm gonna mess it up again. So, I know, it's okay. just say, give your company. <laughs> Yes, I mean, so, uh, you know, I understand. Um, I guess one of the key challenges that small businesses lack is the access to capital, which is one that gets a lot of attention, you know, not being resourced enough to be able to sustain yourself on a, a larger project. Um, in addition to that, access to knowledge. I mean, so, you know, you know, when we looked at our smaller scope work, we had extremely strong knowledge based on that. But then as we got into more difficult jobs, you know, where do you, the chicken and egg, where do you learn how to do something you've never done? Um, and so joint ventures definitely gives an opportunity to learn from someone else's mistakes uh, and also limited opportunities. And so generally when you're smaller, um, minority and African American in our case, you just aren't viewed in certain opportunities. Uh, you know, so no, you don't get the calls for certain projects. And so, and you know, that's something I think is innate, innate to all small business. And so in, in JVs, that allows you that opportunity to kind of put in your resume something else that you know you may not normally have been even considered for. So what are some of the uh, tools and the tips that you would give to a small minority business? Uh, I think offhand, know your industry, uh, not just know the, the work you're specifically doing, but know your marketplace. Uh, there's any trends, there's, uh, there's always somebody doing it better. Uh, so trying to see you know, what, what could you can learn from someone else. Um, you know, just also thinking ahead, right? Like so, you hear, we hear a lot in business about business plans, but kind of having it as a living, breathing document and, and, and just being responsive, things happen. Uh, the global pandemic is something no one prepared for, but trying to prepare for things or, or, or growth in your business. We knew very early uh, that we wanted to do more than demolition. And so we focused really on, you know, what, what in demolition allowed us to learn something else, whether it was trucking, whether it was re uh, repairing sidewalks, uh, overseeing environmental remediation, just trying to look at, you know, some things just weren't suited for us. And so we think that that in whatever a person's industry they're in, just making sure they look at the whole picture and not just today. Okay. And so what I know, and for those that did not know, you previously contracted with the city of Detroit primarily for demolition. What made you decide to provide other services? Um, I think, you know, just as a small business, you have to survive. And so you always try to be nimble um, and think about uh, how can you be better suited for your client? Um, we look at uh, our work with the city, not just the city is our client, but the residents are our client. And so we look at, you know, how can we better be suited? Um, and just, just, you know, we're, as you mentioned, 81% Detroit resident. And so we want to make sure our people can continue to work. And so you want to have more offerings than just one product line. And so for us, it became very evident, you know, the same excavator we use to demolish the structure is the same excavator we use to uh, tear up a road or, or, or remove some street to put a water main. And so we just wanted to make sure we were cross using um, our technology. And so it, it, why do you think joint ventures are important for small minority businesses? Um, I think joint ventures, the way uh, the city is doing with, uh, you know, under council president's leadership and even administration like this focus on equitable joint ventures. Uh, Tony mentioned OCP's done, you know, you can't be certified if you're not really all the way through the job. I think those opportunities give small businesses like ours an opportunity um, to participate on work that we normally would do. We never, we never would be doing uh, the streetscape on McNichols had we not been partnered with someone who, who already had done it. Uh, we don't need your office or anybody office getting calls about residents about the road isn't done right or whatever. And so it just gives a per, it gives new businesses or smaller businesses an opportunity to get knowledge share, um, to learn about better vendor pricing. Um, we've seen a tremendous level of support from Major Cement and saying, "Hey, why are you guys paying this? You should go to this vendor." So things like that, um, just people that have already been doing it a lot longer. I think I think this is a great way for small businesses to grow and not have to just try to 
you know, ink along just piece by piece. And, and thank you so much, because everyone knows when I get a contract, those are questions that I ask. How many Detroiters do you hire? Did you um, try a joint venture? Those are questions that I ask almost on every contract. And so talk about some of the advantages of the utilization of city contracts to get opportunities in other cities, as well as in the county, the state, and the federal level. I think this is a great question. I think that uh, I, I try to tell people that doing work with the city of Detroit has opened up doors in ways that we never would imagine. So like we've had the opportunity to participate on the Gordy Howe Bridge uh, and do site work over 170 acres. Um, we participated in the demolition of the Conner Creek Power Plant. None of these things would have happened had we not had a steady work, base of work with the city of Detroit. We never would have been able to buy machinery, trucks, uh, keep a workforce working. So then uh, we're, uh, as, as Linda knows and your team, we're, we're, a, we're a union shop. So we, we very much uh, have to you know, we pay living wages. And so that workforce is, is only going to go where the jobs are. And so we would have never been able to do uh, these other things. And so we just try to use an example of saying, hey, look at your work that you do in a city. One, obviously, is great to do uh, work in a community in which we live, but also giving Detroiters an opportunity to work on projects in the private sector at the county, uh, you know, at the state level, and just looking at it as a baseline and always taking care of that base, but growing from that and letting that be a piece of an overall bigger picture. We I think it's a great opportunity for any small business to do business with the city and just use that and also grow jobs outside of the jobs you get from the city. So thank you for that. And, I, and so I talked about earlier that you employ 81% of Detroit residents, and I thank you for that. How can a Detroit resident apply for or find information on working for, let me try this, Guy Yanga? Yes, yes. So um, the first way is our website, our guyangacode.com. Um, yeah, you can apply. Um, we've hired people that come up on job sites that are very forward. Uh, if they come to your skill trace task force, um, you know, we're, we're readily accessible. Uh, we're always looking, even when we necessarily don't have a role to fill, just uh, to better understand what the community skill sets are, um, where the need is. And so I think those are some of the easiest ways to find it. Thank you so much for all that you do in the city of Detroit. Thank you so much for what you do in the city of Detroit. And thank you so much for being in the city of Detroit. I'm going to move on over to Michael, and so Major Seaman has been a company in Detroit for a, a, a little while. Can you just tell us how many years yeah, uh, thank Major Seaman has been in the city of Detroit? Yeah, thank you for having me, first off. And yeah, we've been in Detroit for uh, just about 40 years now. I knew it had been a while. I, yeah. I, I knew it had been a while. <laughs> yeah. You don't even look like you're 40 years old, Michael. So. Oh, well, I appreciate that. I'm 42. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about why you decided to locate your business in the city of Detroit. Um, well, it, it's always been here since I since since I started, and I, I, the the original founders uh, he lived in Detroit, and uh, all, all the all the partners lived in Detroit, and um, they they just they they found a good spot in Detroit and wanted to be where that you know wanted to be in Detroit, so they 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 uh, made home base here, and we've just grown it from there. I, I truly thank you for that. Also, often we see people um, working for companies and we know that they're not Detroiters. Can you explain the importance you see of hiring Detroiters and minorities? Yeah, um, like I said, Detroit's, Detroit's been home base for us for, for about for over 40 years. And um, we've done a lot of work with the city of Detroit. And it, so, so we just felt we feel it's important to support the community and support its residents who in the cities that we're working in. And uh, since since we do most of our work in the city of Detroit, you know, we, we want to employ Detroiters. Um, and it's also, uh, you, you know, we're, we're we're in Detroit, so we we have, we have a little easier access to Detroiters too because we're because we're, we're, of proximity. I clap to you as well. To talk about how you're able to attract Detroiters and minority employees. Uh, I, I guess the, the first avenue we do, like I said, we're talking about proximity since we're here in Detroit. Um, I, I think Detroit, Detroiters see our trucks. We, they see us on the job. They ask us about a job. They refer to the office 
or to a, a foreman, they give their information to a foreman or manager that gets back to the office. There's also our website. We also, um, there, uh, a potential candidates are directed to our website. And uh, we're also part of, uh, you know, we're also part of three unions. And um, I have an outstanding request with the unions that any Detroiters come in, please send them my way so I can um, see, see if they, they be someone we'd like to hire. Wow, wow, that's a lot. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. <laughs> so how can a Detroit a resident apply for or find information on working for a major cement? The best way is to go to our website and apply online um, at majorcementco.com or, uh, or, or call our office and, and um, they, can, they can just request, they, they can either request a fax number and they can fax in an a, a application if uh, they, they don't have access to uh, online. Okay. And, and so my last two questions are going to be to both of you. Um, what did you look for when you decided to partner for a joint venture? Um, I think I was looking for someone who, who had who had similar values, similar work ethic, and, and, and a passion for the work, and, and like we did. And um, Brian had Brian had uh, invited me to a to a, an event and just start talking to him, and it was really easy to talk to. And I could tell we had s similar core values and and and, and um, similar goals, and it just I don't, it, we we, did, we had a f further discussions of we should join venture, and it just kind of happened organically. I mean, we, I think. I mean, I really enjoy Brian. I think he's a, he's a great guy. So it's like, seem like someone easy to get along with because that's what you need in a partner. Someone who's going to be easy to get along with. I see Marcus shaking his head. Yeah, you definitely need that in a partner. <laughs> I see that going on over there. Talk to me, Brian, about um, what did you look for when you decided to partner for a joint venture? So I think uh, Council President, uh, echoing on what Mike says is that you know, we looked at as obviously there's a smaller or minority company, you want to look for similar core values. We definitely wanted to look for someone who really wanted to view a partnership, wanted to teach. And, you know, it was very clear talking to Major Smith that they didn't want to be a part of any JVs where the other person wasn't bringing anything to the table. They weren't going to do any deal um, where they just were like having a minority partner just for the sake of some certification. And it really came down to a, 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 a skill set. You know, they were, um, I had done a lot of work and work that we weren't familiar with. And then the work that we were familiar with was something that wasn't their strong suits. Uh, obviously, as both being unions, uh, we're obviously only going to work with union shops. And so that made it easy because we belong to the same unions. And it was just a shared value that a commitment to Detroit. Both of us were headquartered in Detroit um, and really wanted to be a part of, you know, doing something that was could not only be uh, valued and respected in the city, but could be valued and respected outside of the city. And so that was, that was just a shared value. And that was something we looked for. And um, they wanted to, they were, they wanted to grow and be aggressive. And, you know, we wanted to grow and be aggressive. And so that just was something we felt that we just made the most. And so why did you didn't, why did you decide to just execute that joint venture partnership as a team? Um, I think it was, you know, lo again, looking at the work, you know, the city has done a great job in putting out a diverse amount of work. And, you know, there's only so much you can bite off on your own. Um, and there's only so much you have expertise off in your own. And so, you know, we want, we saw an opportunity to say, hey, you know, uh, when joint ventures are done properly, they give opportunities for both companies to grow. Um, I think diversity is always a great thing. Um, and just giving different perspectives, right? So Mike, uh, uh, you know, grew up in it. And so he had a different perspective and journey growing up in the, an industry that I had um, as an engineer. And so I think we just saw uh, it made the most sense. And then um, in addition to, the Nichols, um, we ended up winning a couple more streetscapes. And so we just, we just saw an opportunity to grow. Uh, we're going to be doing Conan and uh, I think Grand Parklet and just looking at other opportunities where we can put more Detroiters on. Um, and also just the, there's a, there's a part that we talk for in, in your skilled trade task force where getting younger people involved. And so we wanted to make sure between the two companies, we had enough, we knew we had enough senior people in, in uh, various d disciplines just to make sure Detroiters had an opportunity to say, you know what, I might want to do demolition, but, I, or someone else may say, I want to do roads and I, want, I may want to get off into this aspect. Just making sure we could put our best foot forward and that's kind of what took us down this path. Do you want to add to that, Michael? No, I think Brian, you know, all, all, all the points. Um, we, like I said, it, it kind of, when we uh, were talking, we're like, we need to do something together. And um, when the uh, McNichol Streetscape came up and I was like, hey, 
Brian, what, what, what do you think? And he, and he, he agreed. And we just, uh, you know, w you know, went together on that one and, um, hopefully develop this into a, into a, a, a larger relationship. Thank you for that. And so to my listeners, you have seen two awesome teams that are working together that are doing great things together. I want to say thank you to all of you. I don't know if we have any callers that have any questions online. If you press star nine, uh, that will raise your hand. I don't know if we have any questions on Facebook for either one of our teams. Um, do we have anything on Facebook? Can't hear you. Not at this time, Council President. Okay, and what about callers on the line? Uh, no callers on the line. Callers, if you have any questions, if you will push star nine. Okay, well, we don't have any callers right now. Is there anything that I did not ask that any of you would like to add? Uh, I, I would say Brian I'm just- isn't shy. I would, I would say I'm, I'm pretty um, excited to hear, um, Brian, that you guys are doing the streetscape over there on McNichols, because um, you all are part of, you know, just this whole goal to beautify that corridor. So uh, I want to thank you and your team, uh, Michael, uh, just because um, the guys that have been out there, because I've been seeing them, they've been very open, you know, they've been working with us. And I know, um, you know, I know they got some good leadership behind them. So thanks, guys. Thank you, Brian. I saw you getting ready to say something. I know you're so shy. I'm gonna have to push you real hard to say it. <laughs> no, I think no. I think that um, I just say in closing. You know, I think that more small businesses uh, need to be open to talking to people that they don't normally have a relationship with. Um, we, I mean, we we cold bugged Mike, uh, his team, got them to an event. He said, "Hey, come to this event with us." They're like, "All right," you know, had no, they had no expectation. We were very just just realizing that you know, you know because of different journeys, just just figuring out what makes sense. Um, but we'll never get there if we don't step out and start having the conversations. Every conversation isn't going to be something that leads into a, a partnership like this one did. We had many of the ones that didn't, but it also helps you learn what you don't want. And so um, I just think with all the opportunities that are going on in the city, that if encouraging more of our vendors to just you see a sign or a truck driving by, I mean, call the office. I mean, that's literally how we started looking. We didn't know anybody working major. Uh, we, we just start calling people and saying, hey, this is what we want to do. The city's really got some opportunities and just seeing where it lands. And I just think that this is an opportunity, not just for Major Cement and Bianca, but for all city businesses um, to, to participate. And Bianca just stepped out there on Faith and look what Faith brought them. Michael, did you want to add anything? No, I just want to thank you for having me on and uh, this opportunity uh, uh, to, to speak to you today. Thank you. Okay, I see our two smiling women sitting there. I'm going to uh, go to Marcus partner first and then Tony, I'll end with you. Um, Mr. Mumba, did you want to add anything? Can't hear you. Huge. Um, the one thing that I will add is we have um, started a partnership with GPSCD. Their vocational programs, they do, they now allow for on-job training. And so if they're in VOTEC program, they can come to your job instead of going to VOTEC. They can start working as early as um, 1030. Uh, the person we talked to is Tanisha Brogan. And um, so long as you can provide them with the liability insurance, I think there's a general liability and something else. But I, I say that to say, you know, obviously it's something that we will use in our workforce development, but these are individuals, these are young kids, right? They don't know right now they're engaging in Voltec because they want something that's hands-on, but they're not quite sure where they're gonna go. And so um, I would say that to anybody who's listening, whether it's a small business or not, DPSCD does have that resource um, of using their students for what they call um, on the job training and they get school credit for it. And so I, that's the only piece that I would add. And just thank you for having us here. Um, these type of conversations are, are helpful because I don't think, even though we would see major cement and I, 
C major cement because they're over here on, on where I live on uh, Kirchhoff and Van Dyke and now they're where the pizza bar is. I don't think I would be able to put a name to a face to all the streetscapes. And so it's important because we know now what they, what they look like. Uh, you know what everybody looks like and we know what their vision are. And we know that they're true to Detroit, right? Um, and so that's something as a Detroiter you just got to love, right? So. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I always say it helps to develop those relationships with people. And so it's so important to have you all here to see what each other looks like and to be able to talk to each other. Tony, I said you would be the last smiling face. So go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Okay, I can hear you, Tony. Hello. Okay, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Council President. On behalf of Mr. Boise Jackson, our Chief Procurement Officer, uh, we appreciate you so much uh, for always allowing us to join your conversations and for your staff working with us and helping us um, with our supply schedule and other opportunities that we have. Um, for your callers that are out there listening, if you're interested in finding out about any of the upcoming bid opportunities so that you can have an opportunity for a joint venture or something, you can always visit www.detroitmi.gov forward slash supplier and you can look on the tab that says open bids. Um, we do have quite a few opportunities that are coming up. Um, and so we encourage you to take a look at that and um, you can reach out to me if you need to at 313-378-8362. Or you can always email me at limit, L-I-M-M-I-T-T-L at DetroitMI.gov. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as we close out, I again want to thank everyone, everyone who has joined me this week live from Council's table. Please join me tomorrow at 5 p.m. for a very special event, Black Voices on Black Lives, Perspectives and Calls to Action. I'll be joined by my brother, my friend, and a special guest, none other than Judge Greg Mathis and several others to discuss ways to bring about racial and social justice to black people. Then on Friday morning at 9 a.m., I will be joined by my fellow council member at large, none other than Janae, Council Member at Large airs for a special June 10th coffee, tea, or whatever your favorite morning beverage is in conversation to discuss criminal justice reform. We will also have special guests, Judge Aliyah Saboy, Attorney Todd Perkins, and others. So we have some exciting things happening tomorrow and Friday. I ask you also to follow me on social media or visit my city website at www.detroitmi.gov forward slash Brenda Jones to be added to my email distribution list. I say to you, have a wonderful Wednesday. I have to thank Team Jones, who's always on it. They are my boss. They keep me going. They keep me straight. <laughs> so I thank all of Team Jones for all the hard work that you do. I love you. I truly appreciate you. I say to everyone, please don't forget while you're out, cover that face, put that mask on, stay safe, keep everyone else out there safe, keep your family safe. I love you all. I thank you all for joining and for participating with us this Wednesday afternoon. It is gorgeous outside. Don't forget, not only keep that mask on, keep you some hand sanitizer close by so that you can keep those germs out of your face when you get ready to touch your face. Again, 
Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for doing business in the city of Detroit, having your business in the city of Detroit. 40 years, Michael, is a long time to be in the city of Detroit and still look like you're 21 years old. Thank you again so much, and now you have that great experience. Thank you so much for hiring Detroiters to everyone, and again, for being in the city of Detroit. I appreciate you. I love you. And until we meet again, God bless you. Stay safe. We're tuning off. Bye-bye to everyone. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much. You.